got it out. But we do greatly appreciate and love you. Genesis 49, as we are looking at these prophecies concerning the sons of, of Jacob, we're going to move on to the next two sons. And we recognize in this passage that they were brothers. Now, I, I've had the blessing that some don't have, and I have a, I've been blessed to have a biological brother. We grew up in the same home. We enjoyed many of the same things in life, and we even enjoyed and shared the same bedroom. We had wonderful times together, but we also had our moments that we're not very proud of. But one thing about my brother and I, we may have had our quabbles, our disagreements, and even our fights. But when someone was standing against one of us, we stood together for each other. We had a, a bond, which you call today as brother. Now these days we live many miles apart, but one thing has happened. We have grown closer and stronger in our respect and appreciation for each other. The greatest blessing is that not only are we bi biological brothers, but we are now also brothers in Christ. Family blood is very strong, very powerful. It's a bond that is second only to the bond that we have as being brothers under the blood of Jesus Christ. It's a relationship that will grow, strengthen, and that will last forever. We stand together this day encouraging each other in Christ, encouraging one another to be the man of God God called us to be. In Christ, brothers as well as sisters are called to encourage each other, build one another up, even as they see the day approaching, and that day the return of Christ. The further we go along, the more we should encourage each other, stirring one another to do good works by influencing them with our own Christian lifestyle. Unfortunately, in this story this morning, it's not the case. It should have been brothers encouraging one another rather than tearing one another down by their actions. Remember the cartoon, Peanuts, with Peppermint Patty after her first day of school, met with Chuck, and Chuck asked her how her day was, and she said, I had to go to the principal's office. And he said, really? He went to the principal's office. He says, yes, Chuck. You know, we're friends, and it's all your fault. He said, my fault? She said, yes, as friends, you should have been a better influence on me. <laughs> you know, as brothers and sisters, we ought to be better influences on each other. Uh, Simeon and Levi, unfortunately, were not very good influences for each other. In verse 49, or chapter 49, verse 5, it says, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their knives are vicious weapons. So in this prophecy concerning these two brothers, Jacob has a word to speak to them, and I hope a word to speak to you and me. Because in this message this morning, certainly we can see the tragedy of the life of these two brothers, but we can also see the gracious mercy of God working out in history in this family. These were the second and third of Jacob's sons born to him from Leah. They, unfortunately, did not encourage each other in good works. Rather, they stood by one another in wickedness, which fed their violent and treacherous tendencies. Jacob called them angry, and he called them cruel. They were a horrible influence on one another. Let's look at that and use that for our benefit today as we live for Christ, trying to influence one another in a positive way. So first thing we need to do in your outline this morning is let's look at the cause of this evil influence. Now I have to admit, my brother influenced me in bad ways. I blame him like Peppermint Patty blamed Chuck. Now unfortunately I was probably uh, the one that influenced him in ways that I am not proud of. And we need to be careful about how we do influence one another realizing where they come from 
this evil influence. Number one, the source of evil influence. The cause in man. It comes from within. And I think we can see this in this passage. In verse 6, the latter part of verse 6 and verse 7. He says, for in their anger. Where does anger come from? Well, it comes from within. It's inside of us. For their anger, they, in their anger, they kill men. And on a whim, they hamstring oxen. Their anger is cursed. For it is strong and their fury, for it is cruel. Now, this, like Reuben's situation, is a reflection on a historical event. Reuben, as we know, the first son, uh, took uh, Bilhah, which was Jacob's concubine, and took her for himself. And we saw that back in history and how that caused him to experience the consequences of sin in his life. Now, these boys did the same thing. We see that in history, back in chapter 34, we looked at a few weeks ago, that uh, these brothers were hurt, offended, because of what was done to their sister. The son of the leader of the people of Shechem, he was fond of their sister, and he went ahead and took advantage of her and raped her. He loved her. He wanted her to be his wife. Well, in order for that to happen, the family decided that these men need to be circumcised. They need to become like the people of God. And then they would turn over their sister or even Jacob, his daughter. Well, these men were treacherous. They had no intent to release their sister to this man. After the men were circumcised, as they agreed to, while they were still in their pain, Simeon and Levi went into town and destroyed all the men with their swords. The brothers follow along and they destroyed all of their livestock and even took what was available to themselves. And this was what happened. As a result of their anger, because they were so offended and hurt, by what was done toward their sister. They took it personally, and then they took it out of the people at Shechem. And for this reason, we understand that they suffered the consequences of their sin. But it came from that anger within. It comes from within. You and I need to realize where our biggest enemy is when we influence in evil ways. It's within us. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, tells us to be angry... It's okay to be angry, but don't sin in your anger. And don't let the sun go down in your anger. Don't allow it to continue to fester, but learn how to let it go. Then we're told in James chapter 1, verse 14, but each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. So that rage, as a result of the anger, then becomes fleshed out in their lives, and it was in the lives of these two boys, in the way that they treated the people at Shechem. To such an extent, they also treated their dad in a horrible way, because he said, as a result of this, I am now a stench among the people of this land. All because of the rage and anger from within. Now, let her be. Although the curse is within man, there is, uh, or the cause is within man, there is a, a curse upon man in verse 7 the latter part here's what god said what would happen i will disperse them throughout jacob and scatter them throughout israel so basically as a result of their sin they're going to be scattered they're not going to have their locality in which they're going to be able to commune and fellowship as family they're definitely going to be scattered punishment is certainly linked to the crime And the antithesis of a punishment or a curse is a blessing. And in this case, they were not blessed. They were cursed. Simeon, what we find, that when he finally was allotted his land, he was allotted the land, and it was a portion of the land given to Judah was given to him. Now, if you know anything about the people of Israel, the two southern kingdoms were referred to as Judah and Benjamin. And the other ten were the northern tribes. But you'll notice, often when we referred to the southern kingdom as Jude and Benjamin, you very rarely, or if ever, 
here the name Simeon associated with it. What we see in Scripture, verse Joshua chapter 19, verses 1 through 9, it says, This second lot came out for Simeon, for the tribe of his descendants by their clan. And their inheritance was within the portion of Judah's descendants. So you get a picture, Judah's land was given to them, and Simeon found his place inside of Judah. He didn't have his own land. Verse 9 tells us the inheritance of Simeon's descendants was within the territory of Judah's. Now, later on in 1 Chronicles chapter 1 and through chapter 11, we can see that Simeon's family was even further scattered as a consequence of his sin and the prophecy that Jacob proclaimed concerning the boys. Now, Levi, likewise, was scattered throughout. What we know from history is that there were 48 Levitical cities where they were responsible for the teaching and living as well as going and back and forth providing for all of the work that needed to be done at the temple. So they were scattered in these 48 cities throughout all the tribes of Israel. So again, likewise, the prophecy was fulfilled through Levi and the fact that his whole family was scattered throughout all the people of Judah or Israel or Jacob and Israel. Now during David's reign in 1 Chronicles chapter 23 verses 2 through 5, it says then he gathered all the leaders gathered all the leaders of Israel, the priests and the Levites. The Levites 30 years old and more were counted. The number of men was 38,000 by head count. Of these, David said, 24,000 are to be a charge of the work on the Lord's temple, 6,000 are to be officers and judges, 4,000 are to be gatekeepers, and 4,000 are, are to praise the Lord with the instruments that I have made for worship. So you can get the picture. These guys are scattered throughout all the kingdom of Israel, and they have the responsibility of going to the temple and being sure everything is cared for as far as the worship is concerned. So you get the picture. These guys had to travel a lot back and forth in their cities, fulfilling their responsibility and obligations at the temple. Quite a challenge. Quite a curse, to say the least. Now, you and I, we similarly uh, suffer from the same sort of curse today. How many of us are scattered? Think about our families today and how scattered they are, how separated we are from loved ones. If it's not physically We also know what it means to be scattered by life. Death scatters us. Some are here and some are gone. Think about it. Very rarely do you find families living together. Most of your families, if you're going to go for the holidays, you have to go somewhere or they're coming to you in order for you to get together. It seems like we're still suffering from that curse today. Separation. But there is a glorious hope. One day, heaven will be a place where we will be gathered with our loved ones in Christ. Won't that be an awesome experience? Think about it today. Do you realize that church is a little bit of heaven on earth? You and I are scattered throughout the week, all the responsibilities and obligations we have, and then every Sunday we come back and we we gather together. This is basically a picture of what it's going to be like in glory. All separated and all together forever and ever. I like to picture that, you know, I don't have to travel anywhere to go see my family. Those who are in Christ are going to be all there together. There'll be nothing separate, there'll be no limitations. For instance, we are going to be like Christ was. When Christ was resurrected, how do you think he appeared to the disciples when the doors and the windows were locked? There was nothing physical to keep him from being able to go from one place to another. How about when the Two on the road to Emmaus were there with him at the supper and and he broke the bread and their eyes were open. They saw him and they looked and he was gone. You and I are going to have that same privilege. We're not going to have those physical limitations in heaven. We're going to be able to go to Thanksgiving and have the whole family there and be with the whole family. It's going to be neat. The curse is going to be reversed. And that's the point I want to make this morning most importantly. Although there are consequences for our sins, God is a gracious God who is willing to forgive us. He's willing to cleanse us. And he's willing to use our lives to truly make an impact now and for eternity. We've all messed up. 
But God is so gracious to us and so loving. Even though he is just, he is also merciful. And we have hope. Hope in him. Number two, I want you to see the strength for godly influence. All right, with this gracious God comes the strength we need to not trust our own ways, but to trust him. By letter A, an inward transformation. If the source of the problem that you and I have concerning sin, like anger, and then acting on that anger, if the source is within, guess where the transformation has to take place? From within. That's why we use the phrasing when we come to Christ for salvation, that we invite Christ to come and live within us. Right? And then as a result, His presence, His Holy Spirit, does come and live within us as we repent and trust Him. He graciously lives within you and me. So we trust God's presence in our lives. So when those times when the inward reality like anger raises its ugly head, we trust his presence so that we will have self-control. Now, realize that Christ is not something we just add into our lives. If you bought a piece of furniture and you bring it home, the worst thing you can do is already have that type of furniture in your home and add it to your already cluttered collection. Well, if you're buying furniture for your living room and you still have furniture in there, it's going to be a horrible mess when you add another set of furniture to it. What you need to do is empty your living room of that furniture and then bring the new in. That's what bringing Christ into your life is about. Emptying your life of yourself and letting him come in and have control. He's not an addition. He is everything. He is the focal point of your life. And as we do that, we trust him and him alone. And he enables us to have the self-control when those inward tendencies start raising their ugly heads. This inward transformation is seen in Jacob's life. And let me show you how. In verse 6, Jacob says this concerning his sons. May I never enter their council. May I never join their assembly. For in their anger they kill men, and on a whim they are hamstrung. The inward transformation happens as a result of renewing our mind, renewing our heart, renewing our desires. That only comes as a result of you and me studying, meditating, reading, applying God's word to our lives. The psalmist said it this way in Psalm 1, which is parallel to what we see in Jacob, not wanting to sit in their council, not wanting to be like them. It tells us in verse 1, how happy is the man who does not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path of sinners or join a group of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction. And he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside streams of water and bears its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prosper. So we allow God's word to dwell richly within us. The Bible also tells us this concerning allowing Christ to have his rule and reign in our lives, allowing him to give us the inward transformation so that we trust him rather than our negative tendencies. And, and in, this, in this case, he says, be filled, the Bible says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. If we're filled with the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit becomes exhibited in our lives. And we see that in Galatians chapter 5, verse 23. One of the fruit of the Spirit is identified as self-control. Being in control of your life in the sense that Christ is in control of it. And thus, we don't react to those emotions like anger and sin in our anger. So we have this inward transformation taking place as God renews our mind and our heart as we take his word, study, meditate, and apply it to our lives. Then we have in number two, this leads to an outward obedience. It's reflected in how we conduct ourselves. How we conduct ourselves is going to have more of an impact on the lives of those around us than what we think we ought to be doing in how we conduct ourselves by actually doing it. Outward obedience. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 32. Therefore I say this and testify in the Lord. 
You shall no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their thoughts. They are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. They become callous and give themselves over to promiscuity for the practice of every kind of impurity with a desire for more and more. But that is not how you learned about the Messiah, assuming you heard about him and were taught by him. Because the truth is in Jesus. You took off your former way of life, your old self, that is corrupted by deceitful desires. You are being renewed in the spirit of your minds. You put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness and righteousness and purity and truth. Since you put away lying, speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down in your anger. And don't give the devil an opportunity. The thief must no longer steal. Instead, he must do honest work with his hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. No foul language is to come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need, so that it gives grace to those who hear. And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. All bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting, and slander must be removed from you, along with all malice, and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Here's he saying what's happening on the inside begins to express itself on the outside. You can't hide that, folks. You and I need to realize we can't hide that. One of the greatest detriments to Christianity today is what the world around us refers to as hypocrisy. I don't think the world expects you and me as Christians to be perfect. I really don't. I think they just expect us to be true to what we believe. The fact is we do make mistakes, but when we do, we sin, we confess it, and we ask for people's forgiveness, and we turn from it. But when we blatantly live in contradiction to what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, it has a horrible impact, not only on my brothers and sisters in Christ, but those who do not yet know Christ as their Lord and Savior. So when our hearts transformed and our thinking and our minds are transformed, that enables us then to live out in, in our flesh the desires that God would have for our lives so that we might influence those around us in a very positive and eternal way. In Romans chapter 6, Paul said it like this in verse 12. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. And don't go on committing the members of your bodies as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourself to God as those who are alive from the dead. And present your members as instruments of righteousness. Basically, he was saying, take the members, the parts of your body, because of the transformation that's happened within, and start using those things for building people up rather than tearing people down. Especially the name of Christ. Now, anybody here perfect in that area? None of us are. But notice what he said at the end of that passage in Ephesians chapter 4. Forgiving one another. Confessing our sin and forgiving one another. Although your thoughts influence your actions, it's your actions that will have the greatest influence on your brother. You know that? Although your actions influence your behavior, your behavior is going to have the greatest influence on you and I so desire to have a positive impact on those around us. Number three, the stand of the influential. When we stand, you know, I told you before, my brother and I, we would stand for each other. And today, even though we stand for each other, we actually now stand with each other for who we stand for in Christ Jesus. We want him to be glorified and honored in our lives. We stand with each other for Christ these days. Now, what you'll notice about Levi and Simeon is that their family did continue on. And yes, they were scattered. 
And yes, they did suffer the consequences and the punishment for their sin. But again, let me remind you, there was the graciousness of God working in their families too to turn that around. And we can see it in some of the great lives of those who came from this family. First of all, there was Moses. Moses was a Levi. Letter A. Who would stand for God. Moses would stand for God. As well as many of the other Levites. In Exodus chapter 32, verse 26. When Moses stood at the camp entrance. You remember when they went through that time of worshiping the calf? Uh, Aaron got him off track, or they got Aaron off track, most likely. And, uh, and Moses returned from the mountain, and he said, this is it, guys, we've got to decide. Either we're going to follow these false gods, or we're going to follow God. What's it going to be? And then it tells us in verse 26 of chapter 32, Moses stood at the camp entrance and said, Who is for the Lord? Come to me. And the Bible tells us all the Levites gathered with him. We will stand for God. A Levi. You and I, we need to first and foremost stand for God. Let her be. Stand for God's people. Stand for God's people. Now his dad, Amran and Jacobed, mom and dad were both Levites. And we know that Moses was educated. We know that he had a powerful position. He know that he had privileged power being raised in the Egyptian family. But when it came for the people of Israel to be delivered, who did he stand with? He stood with God's people. Folks, I can't think of a better influence or impact than we're going to have on those around us than when we stand not only for God, but also for God's people. I want people to know who I belong to and who I belong with. And you, you're my church family. You're the physical expression of who I stand with. I stand with all Christians throughout history. But the way that I can express that I do that is through my local church. The church is an opportunity for us to stand with God's people. And when it comes to God's people coming together, I'm standing with them. I want that as to be my example. I remember a, a wonderful couple in, in the church that Heather and I got saved in. And uh, the lady was just a, a powerhouse witness for the Lord. And uh, she began to share with me how she came to know Christ. You know how she came to know Christ? Her neighbor took his Bible every morning on Sunday morning and walked to church. Eventually, she had a conversation with her neighbor. He shared with her it was the result of his commitment to Christ that he was committed to God's people. He shared his testimony. Not only did she get saved, but she also married that man. Just because he took his Bible and explained that he went to church on Sunday. You think going to church makes a big difference? Yes, it does impact not only on brothers and sisters but also those who are around us watching moses stood for god's people hebrews tells us by faith moses when he had grown up refused to be called the son of pharaoh's daughter and chose to suffer with the people of god rather than enjoy the short-lived pleasure of sin for he considered the reproach because of the messiah to be greater wealth than the treasures of egypt since his attention was on the reward by faith he left egypt behind not being afraid of the king's anger for moses preserved as one who sees him who is invisible powerful that's powerful uh, I, I, I hate focusing on the negative so i won't even go there but you know there'll be no, i'm going to do it anyways <laughs> there'll be more people standing for the cardinals who claim to be Christians than they are standing for Christ today. That's what blows me away. There'll be more people who skip church to watch a ball game on Sunday than, than, than there should be. I see no reason why non-Christians shouldn't be at ball games. That's where they, they probably enjoy going. I enjoy going to a ball game too. But if my cardinals are meeting at the same time my church is, guess which one I'm going to be with. All right, letter D. 
Oh, I'm sorry, let us see. Stand for righteousness, Phineas. Phineas is the third high priest that we have in the history and line of Levi. Numbers 25, 12 through 13 tells us, therefore declare, I grant my new covenant of peace. It will be a covenant of perpetual priesthood for him and his future descendants because he was zealous for his God. He wanted to do what was right. When the rest of the nation was going into idolatry, Phineas stood up and said, I will stand for God and the things of God. He stood for righteousness. And he made atonement for Israel. Letter D. We stand up for Jesus. So we stand up for God. We stand up for God's people. We stand up for his righteousness. And then we stand up for Jesus. And I can't think of a Levi better than John the Baptist who stood up for Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 1, verse 5, in the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest of Abijah division named as Zechariah. His wife was from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So he comes from both sides of the family, the tribe of Levi. Malachi chapter 4, verses six through 5 through 6. Look, I am going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of his fathers and his children and his hearts of the children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. That's what John the Baptist did. When people were gathering around him and focusing their attention on him, and he was getting all the recognition, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You think I'm something? I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. He said he must increase and I must decrease. His focus was on Jesus standing from him. That's what God desires for us. And the impact that we're going to have eternally on people's lives when we let those around us know that we stand for Jesus Christ. And the focus is not on me, but on him and his glory and his honor. And then Jesus said this about John. John kept taking all the attention away from himself, pointing it on Jesus. And Jesus said this, I assure you, among those born of women, no greater than John the Baptist has appeared. That's for Jesus. At least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. One that Jesus himself said, no one born of woman is greater than John the Baptist and the least. Here's my conclusion. Number one. Don't miss the grace of God in all of this. Didn't Levi and Simeon deserve that punishment? Wasn't God just in serving punishment? But God was also gracious. Over the years, he used those families in real and powerful ways. Number one, the first one. Levi. He gave Levi this. He didn't get any land, but Levi had a great portion. And what was his portion? The Lord. Folks, if you gain the whole world but lose your soul, what good is it? It tells us in Numbers chapter 18, verse 20, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 9, that Levi's portion was the Lord. He didn't get any land, he didn't get any inheritance. He got the Lord. It doesn't get any better than that. He knew the Lord and the Lord knew him. What a wonderful blessing. Folks, that is the greatest blessing that we'll ever inherit in this world. That we have the privilege of knowing God. We belong to him. What a blessing. Number two, Simeon's great protection. Levi had a great portion, but Simeon had a great protection. Remember where was Simeon located? When lands were distributed, it was located within Judah. When Israel began to apostatize and they began to turn away from God, they turned to idolatry, God came with destruction upon the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom fell. The southern kingdom was spared. And guess who was in the southern kingdom again? Benjamin and Judah. Inside the tribe of Judah, Simeon was protected for over another 170 years. You and I have our confidence and trust in the Lord. We have already been given the greatest portion. 
the graciousness of God in giving us him is probably the greatest blessing we could ever experience. And then, knowing that God will always, always protect us and care for us. So that you and I, as we live our lives, we can have a positive influence on the lives of those around us. Sharing with them our greatest possession in Christ and knowing that in Christ we are always, always cared for. Oh, well, you know, I, I look at this passage and you think, you know, can you, anything positive come out of what these boys did? Yes, only because God turns it around. I don't know where you struggle. Perhaps you struggle with things that have been done to you as a result of other people's sin. Perhaps it's been your own sin and you're suffering the consequences of it. It's not the end. Still hope through repentance and faith and trust in Christ, giving him your all. Father, thank you again 